collaborative discussing. I think I'm going to say discussing collaboratively. Lots of organisation. Ideally, they're working cooperatively when you say group work. Chatter. Um, giving the responsibility to the children. <laughs> uh, learning from each other. Group work, fantastic when the teacher can stand back and watch it going on. Group work, yay. <laughs> Thinking about behaviour when you're setting groups is, is really, really important because of the, the nature of the activity. The members of staff here, we went to his wedding recently and his best man, he'd not been allowed to sit to him, sit next to him from the age of six onwards. So, um, you know, every teacher knows those sort of children. As a teacher, you spend a lot of time telling them how to behave, but I think group work can show them how to behave. I think group work is an integral part of teaching, an integral part of learning, and, you know, your behaviour management of a group should be the same as it would be with, with a class. I think obviously it depends on why a group's together. If you've got your children are well trained, I know they're not animals, but it, you know, if, they, if they're in good routines and behaviour in the class is generally good and that you've got high expectations, then it, it shouldn't have a negative, certainly not a negative impact. I sort of go through the language that I don't want to hear in group work, which is Mr Blackburn He's taken my rubber. Um, it also helps if the pupils um, are experienced in group work and sometimes you actually have to, you have to consciously teach them how to work in a group. Sometimes it's just nice to mix things up and get children to work with children that they don't normally work with. Sometimes you make mistakes. <laughs> um, sometimes I will have attainment groups, so higher attaining groups and lower attaining groups. But most of the time I allow children to go into friendship groups for something like DT and art. I tend to uh, mix the children up a lot. They have a variety of different places and seats and all that kind of thing. So they get to sit with their friends some of the time, but they also get times when they're not sat with their friends. And the, I've, I have found the more you do that, the easier they accept it. I put them into groups almost like in character. So I might have one group that's made up of the very confident, mouthy children and one group that's made up of the really quiet children. There's always one person left over at the end of group work. You know, you've got groups of four perfect, but you've got one person left over. And that one person is, you know, in the special group of five. You have higher attainment children are good role models for children perhaps with English as an additional language or for lower attaining pupils. Um, but also that kind of the, the your maybe gifted and talented children, that leading role or mentorship role or the role of the explainer helps to challenge them as well. So I do like to mix them up as much as I can. I only intervene when I think one person possibly is taking over or certain children aren't getting any chance to speak or they really are not getting on as a group and they're not getting anywhere. That's when I intervene. You know, there shouldn't be a teacher overarching all the time just checking that, you know, things are exactly the way that the teacher, you know, has prescribed them. You have a little voice in your head saying, you know, they don't need you, they're doing better, they'll do better learning this without you than with you spoon feeding them. I'm a bit of a wanderer around the class, I tend to walk around the class sort of listening in. And sort of almost becoming a sort of fly on the wall of a group. You can learn an awful lot and have a, get a much better insight into your children if, if you take that role sometimes. Those lessons when you get children working in groups and they're working towards the teacher's learning target and you can step back and the classroom assistant can step back those are those golden moments i think it's crucial really i think um 
obviously every child has their own individual personality so you need to know how they are going to function within a group. So if they're working with one child and someone says something to them, are they going to react? This child will always speak, this child always puts their hand up, this child never allows anybody else to speak and actually I'm looking for um, the quiet girl over in the corner. You need to know children whose self-confidence needs to be developed and put them in a role that's going to allow them to develop. It's useful but it's not essential because you actually get, you learn a lot about them by observing what they, how they interact with each other in a group. But that's the great thing about a primary school is that you know your children really, really well. Obviously, it's going to be, it might be a little bit noisier if the children are talking to each other, but you know, that's a healthy classroom. For me, you know, there should be a bubble, there should be a noise. The noise needs to be about what they're doing. So if they're talking about what they're doing, then that's fantastic. I can work um, in quite a high level of noise until it hits a point where I say I'm drowning. And hear, starting to hear them, starting to hear them be a... Good afternoon, everyone. Could Mrs Durham come to reception? If it's a proper group discussion, I say, I can't hear you, I need to hear you. Come on, everybody should be loud. Yeah, and I think other times it's just... <laughs> ah. If you set them out onto task in a group and there's no noise, it's, it's a little bit freaky and a little bit worrying. It's very um, easy for teachers, and I have quite a, a loud voice in the classroom anyway, to go over them. And what you'll find your, yourself doing is um, shouting over the children, which, if you want them to be quiet, isn't the best way to go about it. So having non-verbal signals is fantastic because then they realise, oh, she wants us to stop talking, not make it louder. I, I set an expectation with my, my children that in a group, really, there should be one person speaking at a time. So we normally count how many groups there are and say, so how many children should be talking? And normally that's five. So if it starts to get to a, a level that's not five people, I stop them and say, mm, you know, that wasn't five people talking, that was more like 15. In which case, they can't be listening to each other if three of them are talking in a group of five. There's an airfield over there. It's uh, there go, same one. Now's the time to get a bit cross. I really like to give the children different roles within the group. We have um, different cards for different roles, so you're the leader, you're the scribe, you're the reporter. One being the chairperson, um, somebody else is the recorder who writes down any decisions that are made, that kind of stuff. Another child reports back to the rest of the class afterwards and how things went. What I found that really works is if we're doing research on World War II, I give each table a focus and then they become experts in that focus. They, all the ones go off somewhere to do their research, all the twos go off and you give them all the tools that they need and then the groups come back together so that each person has different information to share into the group. And there's also a technique where you can give the children um, something small like say three cotton buds and whenever they speak or contribute to their group they put down a cotton bud and when they've run out, they're not allowed to talk anymore. So that means that everybody gets a chance to talk. And you can also see straight away, if there's somebody who's got to the end of the group work session and is still holding their three cotton buds, they obviously haven't <laughs> been joining in. Trying to help children understand how important social skills are is, is quite paramount, particularly, I think, and quite sadly in this day and age. I think the children need to know how to listen. And you have to teach them that there is more than one point of view on a subject. I think about my own class last year, there were some great talkers and they could talk, they could talk and they can talk and they can talk. Sometimes I have to actually make them. So I'll say, right, A, if you're an A, 
If you're a bee, okay, A's, you listen now to the bees. What, what worked very, very well is if I asked children to tell me what their partner had said. So that sort of checks that they have been listening to each other. So I'm not always going to say, what do you think? I'll say, well, what does your partner think? And that allows me to check whether they're, they've been listening or whether they've been daydreaming. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think that's it. we're a little bit unfair because we expect children to know how to deal with something, but unless they've actually been through it or actually somebody's shown them how to do it, why would they know? What's the question again? I think some tasks immediately lend themselves to group work. I do a lot of group work with um, the PSHE. You know, whether it would be maths and investigations. PE, fantastic opportunity for group work. Or history, we were looking at projects um, to do with books. Science is a great one for group work, for example. I love teaching uh, electricity in year two because it's one of the first times that they really start to, uh, the light bulbs come on both sort of uh, <laughs> metaphorically and sort of uh, practically. Yeah, it was such a joyous moment last year when my class made uh, circuits. I gave them the wires, the batteries and the bulbs and that was it and there were squeals of delight when they realised they could make the bulb light up using those things and that was a group activity and once one group had done it it sort of started to spread around the class. I mean, writing a story would work really nicely as a piece of group work but also that's a skill that they need to develop independently too so we try to do a bit of both. Facts and figures you could get group work into just my own personally I haven't used too many of those. In a test <laughs> I suppose. Um, other than that, I can't think of anything where you couldn't effectively use children working together in groups. Oh. I think when group work goes wrong, it's, it's about the worst thing that can go wrong. Chaos. <laughs> um, but that's not a reason not to do it. No, don't be put off when group work doesn't work because it will happen to you, definitely. It sometimes doesn't work as well as expected. Sometimes you'll have a day where two children have fallen out. I think if you as a teacher set the wrong task or the wrong expectations, then it can go wrong. I think when it goes disastrously wrong, you can look at a group of children and think, what have we actually gained from this lesson? You know, we're closer to lunchtime and that's about it. <laughs> that is one thing. If you've got four or five different groups in your class and you haven't quite thought about each activity. I think you know when group work's really badly gone wrong when you have to spend the next half hour mopping up the, the, <laughs> the tears and the conflicts that have happened. But I'd, I've never seen it go spectacularly wrong. Yet. But um, yeah, when it goes right, it's fantastic. So, and um, yeah, it can be one of those golden moments that you can step back from and say, that, yeah, the children are learning, they're doing it independently, they're doing everything that the government says they should be doing, and you know, I'm a fantastic teacher, great. Mm -hmm.